Hey everybody, this is Life is a Gamble, episode number eight. And my guest today is uh, someone I just met. His name is Bob Dancer, actually my longtime friend and co-host from Gambling with an Edge. So Bob, welcome to Life is a Gamble. Thank you. It's good to be here. Glad to be in a studio with you again. If you ever need a co-host, I have somebody in mind. <laughs> okay, I'll keep that in mind. Okay, so I wanted to talk, we talk on this show about big gambles that come up in your life. And I wanted to go back to the early 80s, late 70s, early 80s, when you were a professional backgammon player in Los Angeles. Yes. And at that time, you were playing at a place called the Cavendish Club, and there was not a small amount of cheating going on. So let's start there, about the, the sort of known cheaters that were there at the Cavendish Club. Okay. Maybe go back a few years is how I got to the Cavendish. Oh, yeah, absolutely. Do... Yeah. Okay, now I finished my Ph.D. exams at uh, UCLA in 1972 and got a job at the RAND Corporation, which is a think tank in Santa Monica. Did well there until I realized it's like two blocks from the beach and they didn't really keep track of your hours. And after a while, I got laid off for a bunch of reasons. Uh some of which may have had to do, like, I didn't meet a few of the deadlines. But um, so in 1974, I was unemployed, but by this time had come across backgammon. I read about it in a, um, in a magazine I subscribed to because of the articles, which was, it was called Playboy. And so the Playboy was the first place I heard about backgammon. And they told about games with Billy Eisenberg and Hugh Hefner at the Playboy Mansion. I was going, this sounds pretty good. I think I'll learn about this. So I got every backgammon book I could find, such as they were, which is not very good. And I became pretty good at it on if you're only playing against what we would now call ploppies. Uh, I'd had a lot of games in my past, it's brighter than others, willing to read, willing to study. And so I got pretty good. I got into the Cavendish, uh, and I was no longer really good backing up. At that time, they had backgammon at discos at night. And so the people who played at discos weren't very good. So I took uh, disco dance lessons, invested in um, bell-bottom jeans and polyester shirts, and... Uh, would go to the discos, dance a little bit, and hustle backgammon. And the going was easy, and somebody there told me about the Cavendish West, which is right where Sunset Boulevard meets Beverly Hills. It's from West Hollywood to Beverly Hills. It's basically right on the city limit borderline. When I get to the Cavendish West, it is no longer, it's not like the discos. I'm no longer the smartest person in the room. The people, the, there were professional gamblers there who were every bit as smart as the people I went to graduate school with, people I worked with at the Rand Corporation, and they had been playing this game longer than I had. So I still could hold my own at the $1 game, and probably at the $10 game if I could afford it, which I couldn't. <laughs> The $5 game is where the really good players played, and I had no chance there. But I could watch for free, which was educational. You know, it, it it's funny because, I first of all, my backgammon started almost exactly the same as yours. I think I started maybe a year or two before you did, but I would go to the clubs at night. I didn't take the dance lessons, but... Um, yeah, the the clubs, there was a lot of very easy picking. And, and another good thing, at least in the Chicago area, was a lot of places held weekly tournaments. Uh -huh. So you could go to these weekly tournaments and then play for money afterwards. So I began to watch some of the very colorful players there. Not all of whom were honest. The one, the biggest name, the biggest cheater, was named Gabby Horowitz. Uh who had this lovely wife named 
Marsha. She was a law student at UCLA at the time. Later on, she became famous after she divorced Gabby, and uh, she became known as Marsha Clark, and she was a prosecutor in the O.J. Simpson situation. And she looked nothing then like she did back when she was in her 20s, and we were all in love with her. But Gabby was basically an Israeli pickpocket. He had grown up. He was a street person. He could make checkers disappear. In backgammon, you move your checkers around to your home board, and then you take them off according to the roll on the dice. Well, Gabby could make checkers disappear that he shouldn't disappear. Uh, he could get five checkers off with one roll, where the absolute maximum is four. Gabby could get five off. And you could be watching him, and sometimes you'd see it. Most of the time, you wouldn't. He could, when he rolled a six and a four, entitle him to move ten spaces uh, if if they weren't all blocked. Uh, if it was advantageous to Gabby to move 11, he would quickly just put it down 11 spaces away and uh, pick up his dice. And then uh, most of us at this time were counting out 10. One, two, three, four. And Gabby could tell at a glance how far 10 spaces away and how far 11 was. And so if you go, oh no, it should be back there. And he goes, no, I rolled a 6-5. This is exactly where it's supposed to be. No, you rolled a 6-4. Well, the dice are already off the board. And nobody, and there's no yeah. witness there. And um, when somebody does this once, um, okay, maybe you were wrong. When it becomes regular occurrence, it becomes, well, you better protect yourself. He had co um, colorful language. Um but he was one of the uh, the people, the biggest known cheaters there. And everybody knew he was a cheater. He was kind of proud of the stuff that he could get away with. His hero was a guy named Stanley Thompson, who somebody I had never heard of at the time and later learned that uh, was one of the best gamblers in the world and, and an excellent backgammon player. And he's in uh, Richard's uh, Gambling Wizards book. Um, Thompson wanted Gabby to teach him how to make checkers disappear, and Gabby wanted him to teach him how to play backgammon. Now, my uh, never met Thompson. I'm assuming Thompson wanted that information to protect himself against people cheating him. I have not heard rumors about Thompson cheating, but no, I certainly never heard that. But but there was also there was another guy. Oh, there were several more. Yeah, but the the one I, what I'm getting to is the sort of danger element of this. And there was another guy who was sort of called out as a cheater, and one of the Steve Goldman. Yeah, yeah. I I don't uh, I don't know how to describe Danny Kleinman, but one of I guess what you would say one of the elder statesmen of the game uh, kind of called him out, and yes. Goldman beat him up pretty yes. severely, right? Yes. At the time, uh, Goldman was maybe 30 years old and muscular and a little bit gone to fat, but he might have played uh, linebacker in high school and hadn't gone all the fat. He still had some muscle on him. Danny was probably 55 or 60 at the time and uh, was a um, college professor of sorts. Gammy, uh, Danny was a theoretician. One of the things uh, Goldman would do, and Danny wrote about it, was invite people to his house uh, where they wouldn't have to play the, pay the cup club fees, and his wife would cook him a nice dinner. But of course, at the house, Steve's board was magnetized. And if, you, uh, if he flipped the switch, um, Double fives were coming. And, of course, uh, if you can roll double fives on demand, you um, you have a real good chance of winning. Uh, so what? Wh how did the fight actually happen? Were you there when that happened? I was not. I did not see the fight. It actually apparently happened in the parking lot of the, um, of the facility. Uh, as soon as Danny got out of his car, uh, Steve was waiting for him and uh, punched him up pretty good. Uh, Danny then, you know, Steve left and Danny went into the club and sat down and 
blood was streaming out of his nose and he was he was pretty beaten up and all of us saw danny as we walked in and so uh you know people going goldman did this and he, he nods and i don't know what kind of legal reper uh repercussions it was faced but goldman didn't appear back at the club again um so it, it there were lots of cheating that lots of different ways that cheating that goldman would do and um he didn't like being exposed so now i want to get to the guy you played right so you now sat down with basically some mob guy to play right yeah, I went by, uh, I'll call him Angel. Uh, he was supposed to be uh, a mid-level mob enforcer in Los Angeles in the late 70s. I did not, I'm not positive there was mob in Los Angeles in the late 70s, but... Every mobster will tell you that there is no such thing as the mob, so... <laughs> and But uh, Angel kind of looked like a 50-year-old Dean Martin, a real good-looking guy. He would usually play with uh, Manny. Manny was thought to be his enforcer. Manny. Wait, Manny was Angel's enforcer? I thought Angel was a mob enforcer. No, Angel was a, a mob boss of sorts. Oh, okay. Uh, then Manny would have been his bodyguard, maybe. Or when uh, Angel needed some dirty work done, he would send need collections done he would send manny to uh, collect and when manny's came to collect you paid so they would play by themselves uh frequently in backgammon you can play a heads up game or you can use a chouette which is three or more players and there's a rotation system that we don't have to get into now and so one of the skills that backgammon players uh need to learn is to evaluate the skill how good your opponents are and so i could see by watching that they were not very good players i had read all the books and by the uh, the late 70s uh the best book was called backgammon by paul mcgreal and that was out and that was that was really eye-opening and roberti had a few books out and uh, so i had absorbed all of the literature at the time and so I was a strong intermediate player. I was not, I never can make it up to expert, but, um, but I was a strong intermediate and these guys weren't close to that. And I could see the mistakes they were making. So I always wanted to play. One day Angel said, you want to play? Let's play. Great. So let's sit down, uh, just the two of us. Uh, other people, when they saw Angel was willing to play with other people that they wanted in the game too. Angel goes, no, I'll just play with Bob. So there were there were witnesses watching. So early on, um, well, in backgammon, you shake dice in your cup and roll the dice onto your side of the board. Okay. Uh, Angel rolls the dice a little bit too hard, and one of them falls onto the floor. This happens to everybody occasionally. Uh, no big deal. So Angel tells me he has a really sore back. So he wanted me to re go down and get the dice. And sure, I was happy to be in the game with Angel. So I went down and I came back and it looked like one of the checkers had been moved one space. I wasn't positive. There are 30 checkers uh, in a um, backgammon game and they move every move. So um, they... So you don't really memorize the position every time. But I was pretty sure uh, it was not where it was supposed to be. So I look at him and looked at him and he's looking, staring at me, daring me to call him out. Don't say a word. Uh, two or three minutes later, one of his dice falls on the floor again. Bob, my back really hurt. So this time I take time to memorize the position before I went down. Go down. Sure enough, it's changed. So I put the checker back where it belonged. So he said, are you calling me a cheater? I'm going, I don't know who moved the checker, but I am sure that it's correct now. 
He grunted, and the game continued. Two minutes later, the game falls on the floor. The die falls on the floor again. Bob, can you go down and get it? My back is killing me. So I go, yeah, I can do that, but I first got to go to the restroom. Um, uh, I got to go pee really bad. So instead of going to the restroom, I left the Cavendish West. I just walked out the door. At that time, I was stuck $40 with um, Angel. Knew that when he could move the checkers any way he wanted to, no matter what he rolled, I had no chance. And so I wasn't going to play him anymore. And uh, and I didn't think I owed him any money because I was likely he was cheating before I got wise in the situation. Other people saw what had happened. It was everybody agreed Angel was cheating. So I would get phone calls from friends I had at the Cavendish. Some were on the order of way to go. Don't let the SOBs get away with that. There is nonsense. Uh, good way to stick up. And other people about the same number would go, are you crazy? Is your life worth more than $40? $40 is nothing. This guy, these guys could kill you or put you in the morgue, anything. So I, about 50, 50, I finally called the current owner of the Cavendish West. It, this was a revolving door. They would change hands and there were a lot of people who were owners for some time. This one was Bernie Case, who'd been a floorman there for years. Doubtfully had his own money. So he was probably somebody else was a bankroll behind it. I don't know who, but uh, he was at least the manager of the place. He had heard lots of stories and he agreed I didn't owe Angel any money, but said, you know, if Angel decides to... Um, kill you or or hurt you really bad don't blame me but so now are you avoiding going to the yeah cavendish i, I stayed out of the cavendish for two weeks uh -huh. and, then, and then i called bernie and so i go okay so i decided to go back so welcome back um people are kind of wondering what's going to happen because angel will come in there sooner or later so finally i'm in the middle of the game an angel shows up and uh, he walks over to the table, makes eye contact with me, doesn't say a word until I rotate out of actively playing in the game. He f gives me the come hither finger and come talk to me. So, you know, I have to do this sooner or later. So I go over there and he tells me that I'm a very brave man and also a very foolish man. He goes, he's going to let it slide this time. But if I ever cross paths with him again, don't expect the same result next time. Did he ever ask for the money directly? Or this all sort of happened behind the scenes with Bernie and... He didn't mention the $40 at that time. But um, actually he did. Yes, he did ask for the $40, and I said, uh, I'm not going to pay. You were cheating. I've checked with the uh, Bernie and others, and we all agree you were cheating. I'm not going to pay you. At that point, that's when he told me I was a brave man, but a foolish one. <laughs> so he decided he's going to let it slide this time, but stay out of his game forever. And... Um, at which point I promptly went into the restroom and threw up. <laughs> wow, literally. Oh, yeah, because well, cause I didn't know what was going to happen. Um, I came away from the Cavendish knowing a lot more about cheating, and there are a lot of cheaters there that I haven't mentioned, but yeah. they were there, and there were a lot of techniques. Learned a lot to protect myself. but um, So losing your money playing fairly is one thing. Losing your money because of cheating, maybe losing your life because of cheating, is something different. I came away feeling I had more to risk from cheating than I did from actually people playing better than me. Yeah, because you get to pick your spots when you're... I mean, to make money, and this is really kind of the reason I gave up backgammon, was to really make money at it, you had to seek out, basically 
you know, sick people, you know, the most money comes from degenerate gamblers who are just going to lose their money no matter what, ha no matter how lucky they get, eventually they're just going to find a way to lose all their money. And it just became kind of um, distasteful to me to have to seek that out. That And in addition, there were just a lot of assholes who, you know, when people are losing their money, they can be really abusive. Uh, and you, ha if you're the better player and you're there to make money, you have to sit and take it while they, you know, harangue you. Um, yeah, poker dealers know exactly what Richard is talking about. <laughs> yeah, yeah. And uh, so that is one of the reasons I never decided to put to become really good, try to become really good at poker, because the same people who play, who are lousy losers at backgammon, are the same type of people who are lousy losers at poker. And they have different methods of cheating at poker, but they're there. Yeah. So, so now I, I play mainly video poker, and I'm not too worried about casinos cheating. I play slots, and there are casinos that I know are not playing fair. Whether it's legal cheating or not, I don't know, but there are casinos here in vegas and elsewhere who are not who are taking unfair advantage of players and you just have to learn what those are and um and avoid that situation well and yeah that's because life is a gamble right <laughs> because life is a gamble <laughs> yeah well good uh th thank you for doing this i think that's a good place to end it and uh as a uh, tribute to uh, Gambling with an Edge, we should uh, do a recommended for the end of the show. Do you have a recommended uh, this week? I have a couple. Uh, let me try the first one and see if that goes. I just finished the book called American Prometheus, which is the book, the, night, the 2005 book on which the movie Oppenheimer was based. So Oppenheimer is of course uh he was the father of the atomic bomb he uh led the um the los alamos um, laboratory where the uh, first atomic bomb was done later in life regretted what he had done uh, was taken down by political enemies later so uh prometheus is a, a person in Greek mythology, maybe, who uh, did really, really well, but they ended up killing him because he d had done so well. Well, my recommended uh, is a book that we have been recommending for over a year has finally come out, and that is James Grosjean's new book called The Ultimate Report. And it is a book that has the basic strategy for I believe it's six of the most popular carnival games in the casinos, Ultima Texas Hold'em, Mississippi Stud, Criss Cross Poker. And if you play those games at all, you really need this book because the vast majority of people play these games so horrendously, you would have no chance of ever winning any money uh, just because people play the game so badly. And so this book has a basic strategy for each of those games and, and a simplified basic strategy that is easy to memorize for each of them as well. And so that's if, – if you like those carnival games and casinos, that is my recommended. I'm actually uh, looking forward to, to, to reading that book. One of my biggest – disappointments on uh, gambling with an edge is james we never got him on the air <laughs> yeah well he was one of those most frequently asked about by listeners saying can you get him and i always said no <laughs> you know there are a few guys like that that just uh you know don't want the jelko was another one yeah yeah um so uh but uh, yeah i mean the thing is even if you don't play the games uh he's such a good writer you know, and so. Yeah, so I'm not a carnival game player, but I will definitely read it. I will learn something about video poker by reading James write about carnival games. Yeah. He just has um, 
the things he looks at are good. I've not seen the book yet, and I'm looking forward to picking it up a copy. Yeah. So that's it uh, for this week. And uh, as always, you can reach me at lifeisagamblepod at gmail.com, or I'm on Twitter at RWM21. And I'll see you next time.